Hello and welcome to this series webinar on finding and using data organized by GESIS and Chester Training. My name is Anna Schwickhardt and I'll be joined by two speakers today, my colleagues Oliver Wattler and Jonas Reiker. They will introduce themselves at the beginning of their presentations and I will now give you a quick overview of the webinar content. I'll start with a brief introduction to Chester for those of you who have never heard the name before. Then Oliver will talk about how to find data, followed by Jonas who will talk about conditions of data access. There'll be an opportunity to ask questions in the end, so if you have any questions feel free to put them in the chat you see on the control panel on the right side. And now let me give you an introduction to Chester. So, CESTA is the consortium of European social science data archives. CESTA is developing standards and best practices for high quality research. And as you can see on the map, CESTA members are states. They are represented by data archives, for example, for Germany, the GESIS data archive, where we are working, um, is the representative. The map shows you um, a number of different, uh, a number of, uh, of other um, additional members. Um, Chester also, which might be um, as particularly interesting for you, has a so-called training group. You can find various free trainings on finding and using data, research data management and data archiving on its website. And I will now pass you over to Oliver to his presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you Anna. Hello from my side, my name is Oliver Wattela. I'm working for the Data Archive at GESIS in Germany and handle, among other things, requests by data users and data depositors. So, before we go into the details of how to best find research data for social science research, let's have a quick look at the definition of what data actually are or is. So, research data are here as a definition from an official institution in Germany create data created in the course of scientific activities, so for example, through observations, experiments, study sources, digitization, most of us are familiar with surveys. So this includes all kinds of methods used to gather data, to come up with the data from archives, from directing interview people, and so on. And this comprises both qualitative and quantitative data. I've put these terms in quotation marks because they cover a wide variety of methods of gathering data. So if you look for data, um, we can distinguish, let's say, three broad areas. One is official statistics, so everything that is gathered by your Bureau of Statistics or institutions on labor market research, etc. Most prominently is census data, like the last one in 2011 in the European Union. And second, there is what is sometimes called process-generated data, or nowadays also found data. I'm going to put on two very different uh, examples here. So social security files, uh, those were classified information until recently, and they can now be used for research. Or social media data, Facebook, Twitter, and other sources. And um, of course, generally about this, second time is that this data was originally not meant for research, so it has to be transformed in some way to be analyzed quantitatively or qualitatively. The third area is the, let's say, empirical social research, so genuinely data that is being created in research projects, most prominently through surveys or today also using digital trace data like social media. And of course here we always need digital data. Now, who offers data access? Providers of data are a wide variety of institutions, like primary investigators, for example, the German Institute of Economic Research, the DIW in Berlin, that offers access to the German Social Economic Panel. Individual projects also offer their data on websites or through repositories. Then you have major players like the World Bank, the OECD, and others. There are research data centers for official statistics, here, for example, from the German 
statistical office, the staff is for the European one, your staff. And then, as Anna has already mentioned, there are data archives or data service infrastructures, like either in Germany or the UK data services in Great Britain, and so on. And SESTA is one of their umbrella organizations. Concerning the World Bank and Eurostat and others, you have to keep in mind that these overarching or umbrella organizations usually offer harmonized national or subnational data. That means that you might find more detail for more recent data on national level, but this data needs to be brought in line with other data sources in order to be used comparatively. Now, a word of warning or an advice on looking for data online. We all use search engines. And of course, they're easy to use, and how could we live without them? But they, too, influence the way in which we search for data, for example, with single-term searches. And they severely might limit the results that we see. So if we go for the wrong terms, the wrong suite of words, we might end up with results that are not useful for our research endeavor. Thus, a systematic approach is still useful, I think. For some search strategies, how do you proceed or how do you start? And I would recommend very much like you would start a research process. Um, you should have a research question. I'm not talking about hypothesis here or testing the research question has made. But of course, a research question holds at least one key concept or does hold many key concepts which you can operationalize. And the operationalization then gives you indicators for measuring the key concepts. And you can use these terms as search terms, meaning you're looking for and searching for data. And when you begin your research, you can start in publications, of course. You can look online. You can go for researchers, people you know who are prominent in their three areas of research, in your area of research, and you can look at theories who have built up and tested theories. And if they have done so empirically, they will mention the data they have used. And furthermore, I would assume three let's say, basic approaches for looking for data, which I would call institutional approach, research approach, and content-based approach. So the first one, the institutional approach, is straightforward. You do find a lot of institutions in Germany, university or extra-university institutions, that uh, do uh, offer data in the area of looking for data. From have a research scope that's similar to the one you were looking or you were hanging at. And here I would mention, for example, Eurostat for official statistics uh, on the European Union. They do offer data most of the time, or they point to repositories or institutions that do offer their data. Then you can also always look for researchers. The publication. Um, that offers information on your research topic and your research question. You look for the researcher, the researcher is most commonly or uh, linked to an institution, a university or a university institution, and either the institution itself or uh, projects will guide you to data. They will either offer it on their own websites or a university repository or one of the data service providers we've mentioned so far. Then a third approach would be what I call the content-based approach. So you do have your research question, you have a topic which you can, as I've mentioned before, rationalize. You have the items and indicators and questions. You can gather them and use them uh, as search terms either online or you go to one of the catalogs that offer that the data service providers offer. Most of them do. And most of them are um, open to internet searches. So if you use the search engine, you will most likely also end up in one of the catalog specialists, either the one by cases or the one by Sester, which are both presented in them. 
Now, let's go over some examples. Say you're interested in young people in Germany, and you will be looking for youth and surveys in Germany, and you will find the German education server run by DIV, one of our partner institutions in Germany, and this will give you a link to the German Youth Institute. So, an institution that obviously does research very much on the topic you're looking for, and the DJI uh, has a research database probably, uh, most prominently for the youth surveys they are doing for the Federal Ministry of Family and Youth Affairs. So that would be a good starting point, and this way you can step down towards the data. Now, another example would be environmental sociology, so a very different thing. You, If you look for this term online, you will find a journal with this title, environmental sociology, but you would also find a researcher by the name of Andreas Stiegmann from Germany now in Switzerland for a number of years, who has done research in this field. Using Andreas Stiegmann's name, you then get, for example, one of his publications, here, a special issue for rational reality and society, together with Peter Schmidt. And it's an issue uh, on environmental sociology, a dated law from 1998. But this publication leads you to a study commissioned by the German Federal Environmental Office, the Umwelt Bundesland, which is called Environmental Consciousness in Germany. If you then search for this study title, you will end up at gate list, which gives you a full range of about a dozen studies that have been conducted over the past 20 years on environmental consciousness, and that do hold a lot of questions on individual behavior for uh, environmental protection. Then a third example for the content-based approach, let's say you're interested in social mobility. Now, this is a broad term, but you can still look for this online. And you can you might run into the publication by Richard Green from 2010 with a very interesting title on educational expansion of social mobility in the 20th century. It's so a very broad time range. And uh, Richard Green offers you an overview of the studies that he's, he's used um, for his publication. And one of the most prominent studies he has used is the Albus, the German General Social Survey. And you can see there's a whole study collection that he was used to study in 1980. The Albus is done by Gezes, and if you look for the Albus online, you will either end up at our own catalog or at the SESA catalog. You will see the series has been continued until 2018. That's only a national study. As you can see here, there are also other studies from Great Britain and Sweden mentioned. And if you are not certain uh, if this is all there is, you might always contact any member of SESA or any other service provider you know, in Germany or in other countries, in the EU or elsewhere. And they will probably point you to other uh, institutions and repositories that can help you on with your research. Now let's have a look, a brief look uh, on one data catalog that you might uh, use for your search, that is the SESA data catalog, which is a specialized catalog for European social science data. And uh, it was set up by the member institutions of SESA, like uh, British Data Services, UPDS, Vagesis, the Norwegian uh, Social Service uh, Institution, NSD, and others. It currently holds more than 19,000 studies, and you can search on a metadata level. In the study descriptions, you will do that to the individual service providers for data access, and you can find the catalog online at sensor.eu. I will not go online now, because uh, we might run into trouble this way, so I prepared just a slide here. And you can see I've looked for the Albus study I've mentioned before. I get 36 hits, and you will get the study description in English. And as you can see, we have what is called a faceted search. That means you can narrow down your search results by topics, collection years, or countries. And uh, countries, for example, are interesting because there are a lot of international comparative studies in this catalog as well. So that was it from my side. 
And now over to Jonas for information on conditions of access. Thank you, Oliver. I'm just starting my presentation. Okay, yeah, so um, as Oliver already mentioned, I am Jonas and I'm now taking over from Oliver. Um, like Oliver, I work at the GESIS Data Archive for the Social Sciences and um, yeah, one of my, my areas of interest and expertise is our intellectual property rights and this is going to be one of the topics of my presentation today. So I thought that what, what I would do is I would begin basically with the next step um, from, from what Oliver presented. Um, so if you have found data that you want to use in your research, what do you do in order to access this access it and how can you use it and what we are going to do is we will have um, particularly a look at questions of intellectual property rights and uh, data licenses for reuse. Um, in the beginning I would like to show you an example which is quite typical for what um, conditions of access and use are described and displayed um, in social science and humanities data catalogs. So just imagine you found a data set that you were interested in in the SESTA data catalog. You went to the web page of the service provider. In this case, um, the example I picked is from the UK data service. Um, now you want to access, access the data, you want to download it. Um, this is what you will be presented with in the catalog. And we can see here that a, a couple of very typical um, conditions for reuse in the social sciences and humanities and I'm going to highlight a few of them. Um, so the first condition for use or downloading the data is that you have to register in the catalog or with the service provider in order to access the data. So this is quite common. Um, you have to sign up for the service, register with an email address, um, your name, possibly affiliation. Um, the second provision made here in the access conditions is that you cannot use the data for um, projects that have a commercial dimension. So commercial use of the data is not permitted. Um, mostly in the social sciences and humanities that should not be an issue. But um, if you think for example of um, research in engineering, um, medicine, biomedicine, um, it is quite conceivable that there are commercial uses of your research and in that case you would not be allowed to use this um, data set. Another provision for use is that um, once you have registered you cannot directly download the data but you have to request access from the data owner. So the person who owns the data um, will receive your request where you probably describe very briefly what you want to use the data for, for what kind of research project you want to use the, the data and then they can decide if they want to grant you access or want to refuse that. On the remainder of this page um, what you see in terms of access conditions is an, a number of bullet points that relate to confidentiality and again that is a very important point in the social sciences and humanities because we deal with data um, that was collected by you know looking at, at persons, um, interviewing persons. We have personal data and so confidentiality is a very big issue. Um, so in, in this um, description of conditions of access you have to agree to not try to identify individuals you are not allowed to pass the data on to any third party. You can only use the data for the, the purpose that you um, requested access for and you have to delete the data after you are done with your research project. And overall, if we look at this, um, this example is, is a good illustration of one of the, the data sharing mantras that you probably have heard quite a number of times already. Um, so we often say that we want you to share the data or, or we want to share our data um, as openly as possible but as closed as necessary. So obviously we, we do want to share data because a lot of benefits 
are related to data sharing. Sharing data has, has a lot of positive effects, positive effects for researchers, for the research community, because it um, emphasizes and, and um, facilitates transparency and replication. And data sharing also has a lot of benefits benefits for society as a whole because it um, promotes scientific progress and helps us to effectively use tax money. But you are, of course, aware that in the, especially in the so social sciences and the humanities, there may be reasons for us to, to restrict access to the data. So this is where the, the second half of this mantra comes in. When we share data, um, we have to make them as close as necessary and this necessity um, usually comes from, um, or very often comes from the need to protect the participants in the research. So we have data protection considerations. Um, we have sometimes considerations relating to the, the researcher who collects the data. So it might be used, necessary to have an embargo on the data because the person who collected them wants to finish or has to finish a dissertation or a PhD thesis. Um, and the third reason, and this is what we will um, look at in more detail in a moment, is we may have to restrict access to research data because of intellectual property rights and um, especially copyright. Now, before we come to the intellectual property rights, I just want to give you an idea what um, this, this mantra, as open as possible, but as closed as necessary, what that means for the basically for the data landscape in, in which we in which we move. So what we have in the social sciences and humanities in particular, but also in other disciplines is we, we have a data spectrum. So we have a spectrum of data that has um, different degrees of openness or closeness. Um, so it's not, you know, either open or closed, but we have many degrees in, in between those um, two ends of the spectrum. So on the one end of the spectrum, we have data that is so sensitive or otherwise um, has to be protected that access to this data is highly restricted and can only be granted to specific identified persons. And on the other end, other end of the spectrum, we have open data where basically access is free for everyone for any given purpose. So there are no conditions whatsoever on, on using and accessing the data. And then if we look at the, the middle ground, the middle two columns um, in this table, what you can see is that we have um, what, what ha is, can be labeled shared data. And this is data that is open and accessible in principle, but where some conditions apply um, on accessing and using the data. So for example, you may have to sign a user contract or you may have to comply with a license that uh, makes certain restrictions on how to use the data. And the shared data is probably the most frequent um, access category or access dimension for social sciences and humanities data. So this is what, what, is mo what you are most often going to encounter when you look for data and want to use it for your research. Um, usually you have some conditions um, attached to this use. Um, yeah, and as I already said, um, one, one reason for um, restricting access can be data protection. Um, this is not what I'm going to look at, Earlier today, there was another webinar, another Ceres webinar, where questions of anonymization were um, also discussed. So if you have um, questions about this part of, um, of this topic, I encourage you to have a look at the webinar recording from this morning. Um, we are going to link that when we publish this webinar, so you can have a look at that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to have a look at um, the restrictions that occur because of intellectual property rights. And um, yeah, I'm going to begin with the definition of intellectual property rights. And um, so basically intellectual property rights are rights that um, you obtain as a person when you create a scientific, literary or artistic work. Um, so in creating this work, 
um, you automatically obtain certain rights. And these rights are intended um, to protect the moral and material interests that you may have in this, in this work. So um, this, so intellectual property rights is, is basically is an umbrella term for a number of rights. And I think the one that you are probably most familiar with and that you have heard most often is copyright. So copyright is not synonymous with intellectual property rights, but copyright is one type um, of IPR. And yeah, I'm going to use that as an example um, in this presentation. So in the, the way that um, intellectual property rights and copyright are then governed and, and regulated is by national legislation. And in Europe, this means if we look at the example of copyright, that there is a European copyright directive, which basically gives um, a framework for the national copyright legislation. It's intended to harmonize the national legislation. Um, and then in each a European state, there is a national legislation that regulates copyright, and that is the um, the legal basis for um, for our considerations here in terms of copyright and intellectual property rights. Before we move on, a second note on IPR. Um, as you see, the, the second bullet point on my slide is who owns intellectual property rights depends on the context. So most of the times the creator of a work owns the copyright um, but and, and the intellectual property rights, but in certain contexts um, it's possible that some of the intellectual property rights are transferred to someone else. And one of these exceptions is um, if you create a work as part of an employment contract in that case, it is possible, for example, that your employer um, obtains certain rights, certain intellectual property rights, for example, the right to, um, to disseminate your work or to use it um, for, to determine for which purposes it's going to be used. Okay, so I have mostly talked about um, works created um, by a creator. So what is the status of, of research data with regard to copyright and IPR? And unfortunately, the answer is not straightforward. Um, it's pretty much the answer. Um, the answer is it depends um, if it depends on context and, and a lot of individual factors if research data can be considered um, protected by IPR and copyright. And um, so I think that in many cases one would have to look at, at the individual data set to decide, which is of course not practical. So I'm, I'm going to try to give some, some guidance. Um, as you can see in the, in the quote that I put on the slide, I highlighted the sentence saying that um, the bare facts cannot be protected by intellectual property rights. So um, the fact that today here in Cologne it is raining and it's about 15 degrees, this is something that I cannot protect um, or that is not protected by copyright or intellectual property rights. However, in order if I collect data, so I, I collect facts and I bring them into a certain form, a form of a data set, which could be, a, it could be a table, um, it could be a diagram, um, I could even make a video or something. Um, so I give the, I determine the form to give these facts. And in, in that case, in many national legislations, it's the case that the form of the facts, the form in which the facts are presented is copyright protected. And um, my recommendation is that you should if you reuse data in the social sciences and humanities, my recommendation is that if you are not entirely sure what the, the status of the data is, um, assume that it falls under, under copyright and intellectual property rights. Um, because in most cases, this is going to be the case. Um, and in particular, if we don't only look at the data sets, but also at the documentation and the, the survey instruments, the questionnaire, for example, um, the latter two are definitely um, protected by 
IPR and copyright. So whenever you, you reuse documentation, when you reuse um, survey instruments, copyright regulations apply. And in many cases, this is true for the data sets as well. So when in doubt, um, assume that the data that you are downloading and reusing is protected um, by IPR and copyright. Now the question is, um, what does that mean? And um, the, the restrictions that come with using copyrighted um, data and, and other works are, uh, they're quite, um, the, quite strong. So um, basically if, if a work and, or a data set are protected by IPR and copyright, um, you are allowed to use the data for personal use. So you are allowed to use it for your research, but um, you are not allowed to share this data um, with third parties without the permission of the rights holder. And when you think about data sharing, um, this, this um, presents us with a problem because imagine a case where you um, collect your own data and then you integrate that with data that you reuse, so already existing data, and the result is one data set that you would like to publish because maybe you have the man mandate to publish um, your research data at the end of the project. The problem is that for the data that you reused and uh, for some for which someone else holds the right, um, you can you cannot send this data to the archive, so you cannot publish this data along with the data that you collected. Um, so you would have to ask the rights holders permission first to do that. So generally, um, when you reuse someone else's data, um, archiving could turn into a problem. And my recommendation is, um, if you're planning to reuse data and publish the results of your research, um, you should contact the rights holder um, very early on in your project and obtain permission um, for publishing the data. Okay, um, after this, this brief intro to intellectual property rights, I would like to have, in the last part of the presentation, I would like to have a look at licenses. Um, so generally, IPR legislation is fairly complex and it is our experience that many many people when they find something available for download free on the internet then often they are not aware of you know what can and can't they do with the with the data they find um, because implicitly they know okay this is copyright protected and there are some things i have to um, to consider but i think in, in practice um, many of us are not aware what that exactly means if something is copyright protected. Um, and a good way to to um, to cope with the situation are licenses because licenses are basically a piece of text where we explain exactly how um, a data set or any other work may and may not be used. So in a license we can write down um, precisely under which conditions someone can use the data. So what can they do, what can't they do? And this is um, a lot more explicit and a lot more straightforward than um, trusting that users of the data are going to have a look at um, the copyright legislation and are going to draw conclusions about what they can and cannot do with the data. Um, so a license could um, could just be a piece of prose text. So you could sit down, write a page um, and say, I want my data to be used in this or that way. I'm um, restricting the, the access to this data under this and that condition and so on. Um, if you as a user download data with um, such a license, um, you are bound to using the data in exactly the way that this license has been written, even if it is just um, a piece of, you know, prose text. And um, the example that we had earlier from the UK data service, um, the description of the access conditions on, on the catalog web page, that could be considered or that can be considered a license. So this is a data use license which explains to you exactly what you can and cannot do with the data. Another approach um, to data licenses is to use uh, a more standardized license. 
And one example of that are Creative Commons licenses. And um, this is what I would like to look at now very briefly. I'm almost certain that most of you have heard about Creative Commons licenses and you probably have seen those um, icons um, that I'm displaying the table here. So the, the idea of Creative Commons license is that <clears throat> it's a modular license. So Creative Commons has defined um, different modules that say very clearly, you know, what is the condition of use? And these modules can then be combined um, in, in many different ways in order to um, create the license that you want to have for your data. So as you can see, we have um, the attribution license module, which says that um, someone using a work has to give credit to the, to the creator. We have a module um, that is titled chair alike, which means that you can um, use the data, but if you want to share it, if you want to share the results with others, you have to apply the same license. There is a non-commercial module, which says that um, basically you can use the data as much as you want to, um, but any commercial use is excluded. And there is a no derivatives module, um, which says that um, you can use my data and you can copy it, distribute it, but you cannot modify it. So the data, if it is um, disseminated and um, distributed, it has to stay in that exact same form. A final module, which is not precisely a module, um, is the, the CC0 waiver, which is um, just a way of saying no rights reserved. Uh, my data are open for everyone to use for all purposes. And an example of um, a license applied to a data set um, is this one here on this slide. This is taken from one of the GESES um, data archive repositories. And as you can see, the license applied here is um, CC by NCSA, which is um, a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial and share alike license. So this means that anyone can use this data, download and use this data, um, distribute it and modify it as long as they give attribution to the primary researcher who is uh, mentioned in the catalog. Um, use is only permitted if it is for non-commercial purposes and if um, someone wants to publish a data set which is based on this original data set, they have to publish it under the same license. So they can't use a license that is more open or more restrictive. So if you use this data set to create something new, you would have to, um, when you publish it, um, you would have to make sure that it is also a non-commercial license um, and you have to make sure that it um, is shared under the same conditions as the original data set. So these are Creative Commons licenses um, in practice and um, with an, illustrated with an example. And just generally licenses are, I think, are a great way of, you know, communicating very precisely what can and cannot be done with the data. And so if you're a data user and you see a license, it is, I think, much easier for you to understand what the conditions of use are. So um, I would greatly encourage everyone who creates data and wants to publish data to select a license. Um, because I think it, it really helps with, um, with data sharing and promoting data sharing and access. Okay, so to conclude, um, I just have, yeah, some bullet points that I want you to take away from this um, presentation. So as a data user, I think the most important message from me is that if you use data, if you download data somewhere, assume that the data is protected by intellectual property rights. And so make sure that if there is no license attached, you comply with the, um, the copyright, the IPR legislation. And if a license is attached, um, comply with whatever you do, comply with the license conditions. It is always possible if you want to do something 
with the data that is not covered by the by the license it's always possible to get in touch with the um, the rights holder, the person who signed the license, and ask them if they are going to grant you an exception in use. So it is absolutely worthwhile to do that. Um, so try to get permission from the rights holders for anything that is not um, granted by the license. The second bullet point um, goes to, to data producers. So if you're a data producer and think about sharing your data, I would very much encourage you to assign a suitable license to your data rather than just um, leaving it, you know, um, under uh, trusting that, you know, it's copyrighted and um, this is this is what the conditions of access are. So I encourage you to assign a license and um, I also encourage you, if you're not sure what license is suitable for your data, um, to seek advice from, from an archive or a library um, because Usually, archives and libraries um, know know about the licenses, Creative Commons license or other licenses, and they will be happy to help you. Okay, so I am. Oh, these are my references. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I am. I am done with my part of the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Jonas. And now um, I'd like to encourage all our listeners and participants again to put in their questions into the chat. Actually, it's now or never. I give you two more minutes and then you can put them all in there. And in between, while you are doing so, um, I'd like to point you to uh, two more interesting um, training materials. The first one would be the one that I already mentioned in the beginning, which is that Chester Training, and you can just Google Chester Training website and you'll find it easily, offers a number of free training materials. So if you'd like to know more about the topics mentioned today, just visit Chester Training. And then also there's a free training course on licensing in the so-called Foster Open Science Portal. I will put a link in the, in the chat for you, for those of you uh, who are interested later. And now, let's get to our questions. I think we start with Oliver, as he um, had the first presentation. So, um, Oliver, on your slide on searching for data, you said that search engines are easy to use, but that they influence ways in which we search for data. Could you elaborate a bit more on that, or maybe name an example? Yeah, um, I would happy, be happy to do so. Um, I mean, I didn't want to mention the, the one <laughs> search engine we're all using, uh, but if you go there and you look for, let's say, um, concepts like responsiveness or um, social stratification, you will, as in many other cases, end up with zillions of hits. And uh, the more search terms you use, uh, the more refined your search will be, and um, it's still it's still worthwhile to think about very specific terms because um, that will give you more precise search results. So um, this is just my piece of advice because what we see from searches in our catalog is that a lot of people are influenced, as I said, by the way they would search online, and they use one or two keyword searches which sometimes doesn't get, do not give them any hits because the terms themselves do not show up in the in the study descriptions or in the metadata as it's called the information within the catalog a lot more shows up online because uh, the search engines of course they crawl information from catalogs from all kinds of sources websites and um, you will end up you will probably miss it you will have this haystack and you won't find the needle this is this is my point so uh, another hint would be take a research question, put in your entire research question, and that will be also it will also give you more um, detail or more precise hits. Okay, thank you very much, Oliver. I think I just got another question for you, and maybe we just um, we just let you answer it before um, we go to uh, Jonas. Um, so the question would be, I'm just reading it to you. I think that might okay. be easiest. I'm working on a project where we are collecting metadata on surveys. We want to share the metadata 
on an online and open data platform we are developing? Do we need to obtain formal consent from the data producers to use and display their metadata? Maybe that's a question for both of you, I'm just thinking. Yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I go first and then Jonas will give you the, the legal details. Um, the point is a lot of questions. Um, you're collecting metadata on surveys. Um, the descriptions of surveys are not that elaborate. So there are no novels, there are no research papers. This is the, the thresholds of what can be protected by, by protection law, by um, copyright law. Um, but you can, of course, uh, um, you can grant, maybe you, could, you should um, cite the sources you're using. And a lot of the, the sources that you'll now find, uh, metadata on surveys, uh, will not only give you bibliographical information on the survey themselves, but also uh, persistent identifiers like DONs or UR, URN, DOIs and URNs. And you should be putting those into your, uh, let's say, metadata uh, data bank, um, which will also make it easier for other users of your collection then to go back to the individual sources. Maybe you want to add something, Jonas, on this. Yeah, um, I'm. So I, the question that I have is, of course, where does what kind of metadata is it, and, and where does it come from? So I think we could make one distinction between um, structured metadata from a from a data catalog. Um, and metadata that is, for example, a, a code book or, um, or a report with, with a lot of um, prose text, basically. So if it is metadata from, from a data catalog, the first thing I would probably do is um, check if there is a license applied to this metadata because many um, providers of, of metadata actually um, give a license to this metadata. So for example, in the in the GESIS data archive, our metadata is um, licensed with a CC0 license, so anybody can use the, the metadata and um, use it yeah, for, for any purpose they want to. Um, so it is possible that um, the source of the metadata already has uh, a license assigned to the data which clarifies your question. Um, yeah, otherwise I would really say it It depends. Um, if metadata is really long pieces or yeah, long paragraphs of text, um, then I think you have a problem because that would, longer passages of, of text, especially prose text, um, would probably fall under copyright legislation then you have to think about you know can I can I really take that um, without the permission of the of the creators um, there's also a question in there about um, data protection hmm. Oliver the the contact details of the data producers yeah, yes, that's a, there's uh, the, the, the person who asked the question added uh, uh, an additional question. They wanted to know uh, whether they can display the contact details of the data producers, including the contact name of the researcher and email. Mm. That is a good question, and it's being debated. Um, that touches upon bibliographical information on publications as well. Um, in my personal view, and that is not, it's not clearly regulated neither in the GDPR nor in the national protection laws. So if you write a paper or you publish something, then you can be cited to have published this information. Um, it's another thing if uh, I find out that you have, I don't know, secretly gathered some research information, some research data, and then I publicize on you. So you are, the researcher is a third party, I actually is doing, and that is not so far-fetched if you take, uh, let's say, uh, secret military research activities, you find out researcher XYZ on your, at your university is doing this kind of research, and then you quote him and you put his name 
uh, on information on a project that should be not published, should, should not be published. Uh, but uh, here um, I see it differently. I mean, I would say that researchers who publish information on their research, um, either publications or data or whatever, uh, they want to be cited. So this is not under GDPR, especially because it's mostly professional information, information you can find online uh, that pub people publish themselves to be contacted, for example, their email addresses and so on. So um, it's uh, this point has been discussed fairly intensely um, in Germany at least, and I think we're overstretching the concept of data protection here if we also apply these rules to information that have been published for uh, purposefully by researchers, yeah. So it's not it's not clear. The, the let's say the the hard edge um, says yes. You have to inform uh, the principal investigators that you are reusing their names and uh, contact information if you repurpose the metadata. Uh, but I would say you don't have to because it's in their own interest that this information is being republished. Yes, Oliver, and, and uh, I'd like to go in the same direction because our host, Irena, she also mentions that um, this information on the data producer could also be, for example, in the case of larger survey programs, in the public information sheet. Right. But I don't think that this is, um, yeah, I, I think that the person who um, added this question um, had something different in mind, in mind probably not such uh, large survey programs, but maybe something different. So thank you very much for answering this question. Is there anything else you'd like to say on the topic? I have maybe one addition, um, because I mentioned that often data catalogs and the metadata you can harvest from them or download from them is, is protected by a or has a license attached to it that allows this use. If there is no license, um, I think well, the, the, what would apply is probably um, database, right? So the assumption would still be that at least part of the metadata is um, protected by IPR, but not all of it. So it, it really depends on where the, where the metadata comes from. So I, I can't really give a precise answer, but one idea to look or one, one area to look at would be database, right? And um, depending on where the data comes from, it, this right would allow you to download a certain amount of the metadata. Okay, thank you so much. Um, Jonas, um, our host Irena just told me that um, one participant is actually raising her hand, so uh, she would like to say something or ask her question um, personally, so welcome whoever you are. Hello, can you hear us? Do you have to open a mic for her? I'm not so sure. Maybe Irena can do that. Irena, can you can you yes, unmute hello. her? Yes, uh, hello. Irena speaking as your organizer. So uh, um, there's, there was a hand raised by Elizabeth Huber. So I think your mic is now on. If you could introduce yourself and ask question, please. Okay, Elizabeth. Um, if you maybe, um, I'm guessing you're having a technical pro uh, problem here. So um, why don't you just put your question in the chat? You can see that on the right side in the control panel. And um, while you're doing so, I'm uh, proceeding with a different question. Okay. So I think we have a, we finally have a question for Jonas now. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, the question would be, Jonas, could you perhaps mention what licenses are most common in the Chester archives or, for example, Gezes? And what about, for example, international surveys like the ISSP, EBS, or what about the Albus? Jonas, can you hear us? Jonas, I think you're muted. Oh, 
Okay, I think Jonas has also has some technical problems. Um, Oliver, do you know the answer for the, to this question, or should we wait for Jonas? Uh, I can I can go ahead and answer, try to answer okay. this question. You usually so um, the, 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 let's say there are four here access. Oh, here you are. I'm okay, sorry. I was I was muted, so and I I couldn't unmute myself. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Oliver, go go ahead. I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, you have to to see uh, the two things side by side. So the licenses and the the access classes or access categories, and you usually have like four access categories. You have a a free, an open uh, access category that's very much like um, CC BY or uh, otherwise. So uh, the research data offered on this access condition is free to use by everybody. That is, uh, for example, aggregated data, time series data, um, older images. Things are not uh, protected any longer. Uh, then you have, you, then you start into uh, the access for for research, because researchers European wide uh, they do. Um, there are a number of privileges if it comes to data protection and copyright law. So researchers affiliated to research institutions can do a little more than the, the regular citizen uh, because there's another trust base uh, for research here. So you usually start uh, that then uh, users of the data have to register themselves, have to uh, put in a, a purpose of use that is uh, scientific purpose of use, an academic purpose of use probably, and then it becomes more restricted. So that would be uh, the free license, a let's say the research license, and then something where you have to, for example, sign um, an agreement, a usage agreement. And then the fourth category would be a very restricted one where you have, for example, on-site use of the data or a, a remote access. That means the data is residing at a repository or a, a data archive, and you cannot directly access it. So um, this is where very sensitive data is usually provided, let's say in the case of the census data from statistical offices, they have very detailed information on regions and professions and so on. And um, I think this is the, let's say, the, um, the default model. Um, you can look at models that have been developed, uh, generic models that data tags uh, you find something under this heading, data tags, online, um, that give you an uh, oversight of, of what you could use. But most data archives in Europe or in CESA, for example, they do use these four categories. Maybe they have another one that is related to, for example, textual information where the licenses uh, kick in that uh, Jonas has mentioned. But I would say uh, this is roughly it. Yeah, I would I would agree, and um, the I I introduced Creative Commons licenses, and they are not unusual. They're often also used for data, um, but I should say that um, whenever data is not completely anonymous, um, and you have to protect the um, the data of the the individuals who participated in the research. Um, a Creative Commons license is not the way to go. So as soon as you have data that um, needs to be protected um, because of data protection regulations, a Creative Commons license is not um, the, the right way to go, I would suggest. And this is why yeah. <clears throat> um, it is not the most common license um, used by the SESTA archives, as, as Oliver explained already. Okay, thank you very much, Jonas. Um, yeah, we have reached our time limit of an hour, and um, I'd like to thank our host, Irena. Also, I'd like to thank my colleagues, Jonas and Oliver, for their presentations. Um, as mentioned in the beginning, we will soon make a recording of this webinar available online.
you will receive a message via email if you signed up for it and then you can find um, the recording again online. You can perhaps use it in your class or just listen to it again if you want to um, want to inform yourself again or remind yourself on the particular topic and um, we thank you very much for your attendance and are wishing you um, a nice relaxing end of this day. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.